Hello, everyone, and welcome to this, the Algonquin Public Library's teen YouTube video series, Get Yeti to Read. This installment, I'm going to be highlighting all of our new books that we got in February for the teen collection. So let's get started. First up, we have historical. Maisie. Maisie has always longed to be on Broadway, but growing up in her small Nebraska town, that has always seemed like an impossible dream. So when an opportunity presents itself to spend six whole weeks auditioning, Maisie jumps at the chance, leaving everything behind and everyone she's ever known. New York City is a shock to the senses, thrilling but lonely. Auditions are bu brutal and Maisie's homesick and she misses the boyfriend whose heart she broke when she left. Nothing is as she expected. With her money running out and faced with too many rejections to count, Maisie is more determined than ever to land a role. But when she discovers that booking a job might mean losing sight of herself, everything Maisie always thought she wanted is called into question. Horror. Bindi, The Illusion of Living. Bindi fans will delight in pouring over the memoir of his ingenious creator, Joey Drew. From humble beginnings to his rise as a force behind the studio, Mr. Mr. Drew offers a behind the scenes peek at his many animation innovations, such as Silly Vision, his rules to animate by, and of course, his unique approach to franchising among the first of its time. The Desolations of Devil's Acre, which is the sixth book in the Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. The fate hangs in the balance in this epic conclusion to the series. The last thing Jacob Portman saw before the world went dark was a terrible, familiar face. Suddenly, he and Nor are back in the place where everything began, his grandfather's house. Jacob doesn't know how they escaped from V's loop to find themselves suddenly in Florida. But he does know one thing for certain. Cowell has returned. Risen from the library of souls and more powerful than ever, Cowell and his apocalyptic agenda seem unstoppable. Only one hope remains, to deliver Nor to the meeting place of the seven prophesied ones. If only they can decipher its secret location in time. Mystery and thriller books. Dragonfly Girl. Things aren't going well for Kira. At home, she cares for her mother and fends off debt collectors. At school, she's awkward and shy. Plus, she may flunk out if she doesn't stop obsessing about science, her passion, and the one thing she's good at, very good at. When she wins a prestigious science contest, she draws the attention of a celebrated professor, Dr. Gregory Munn, as well as his handsome assistant, leading to a part-time job in a top secret laboratory. The job is mostly cleaning floors and equipment, but one night while running her own experiment, she revives a lab rat that has died in her care. One minute it is dead, and the next minute it is not. Suddenly, she's a remarkable wonder kind, the girl who can bring back the dead. Everything is going her way, but it turns out that science can be dangerous, a dangerous business. And Kira is soon swept up into the world of international rivalry with dark forces that threaten her very life. The Initial Insult, which is the first in a duology. Tress Montour's family used to mean something until she didn't have a family anymore. When her parents disappeared seven years ago while driving her best friend home, Tress lost everything. The entire town shuns her now that she lives with her drunken one-eyed grandfather at what locals refer to as the White Trash Zoo. Felicity Tornado has it all, looks, money, and a secret. One misstep could send her tumbling from the top of the social ladder, and she's worked hard to make everyone forget that she was with the Montours on the night that they disappeared. Felicity has buried what she knows so deeply that she can't even remember what it was, only that she can't look at Tress without feeling shame and guilt. But Tress has a plan. A Halloween costume party in an abandoned house proves the ideal situation for Tress to pry the truth from Felicity, brick by brick, as she slowly seals her former best friend into a coal chute. Tress will have her answers or settle for revenge. McGinnis's First book in this duology is a clever modernization of Edgar Allan Poe's short story, The Cas Cask of Amontillado. Payback. This is the third volume in the Vale Hall series. Bryn Hilder has conned a lot of people, from the spoiled rich kids 
to her mom's loser ex-boyfriend, from a motorcycle gang to a senator's son. If there was money to be gained or a secret to uncover, she figured out how to get it done. And thanks to Vale Hall and its director, Dr. David Odin, she's finally found a family of hustlers just like her. The Project. The Unity Project saved my life. Lo is used to being on her own. After her parents died, Lo's sister, B joined the Unity Project, leaving Lo in the care of her great aunt. Thanks to its extensive charitable work and community outreach, the Unity Project has won the hearts and minds of most in upstate New York. But Lo knows that there's more to this group than meets the eye. She spent the last six years of her life trying and failing to prove it. The Unity Project murdered my son. When a man shows up at the magazine Lo works for, claiming that the Unity Project killed his son, Lo sees the perfect opportunity to expose the group and reunite with B for once and for all. When her investigation puts her in the direct path of its charismatic and mysterious leader, Lev, he proposes a deal. If she can prove the worst of her suspicions about the Unity Project, she may expose them. If she can't, she must finally leave them alone. But as Lowe delves deeper into the project, the lives of its members, and spends more time with Lev, it upends everything she thought she knew about her sister, herself, cults, and the world around her, to the point that she can no longer tell what's real or true. Lowe never thought she could afford to believe in Lev, but now she doesn't know if she can afford not to. Realistic fiction. Some other now. Before she kissed one of the Cohen boys, 17-year-old Jessie knew what it was like to have a family, even if technically that family didn't belong to her. She'd spent most of her childhood in the house next door, challenging Rowan Cohen to tennis matches while his older brother Luke studied in the background and Mel watched over the three like the mother Jessie always wished she had. But then everything changed. It has been almost a year since Jessie last visited the Cohen house. Rowan is gone, Mel is in remission, and Luke hates Jesse for the role she played in breaking his family apart. Now Jesse spends her days at a dead-end summer job avoiding her real mother, who suddenly wants to play a role in Jesse's life after being absent for so long. But when Luke comes home from college, it's hard to ignore the past. And when he asks Jesse to pretend to be his girlfriend for the final moments of Mel's life, Jesse finds herself drawn back into the world of the Coens. Everything's changed, but Jesse can't help but one can't help wanting to be a Cohen, even if it means playing pretend for one final summer. Yesterday is history. Weeks ago, Andre received a much needed liver transplant. He's ready for his life to finally begin until one night when he passes out and wakes up somewhere totally unexpected. In 1969, where he connects with a magnetic boy named Michael. And then just as suddenly as he arrived, he slips back to present day Boston where the family of his donor is waiting to explain that his new liver has come with a side effect, the ability to time travel. And they've tasked their youngest son, Blake, with teaching Andre how to use his unexpected new gift. Andre begins spending his time bouncing between the past and the future, between Michael and Blake. Michael is everything Andre wishes he could be, and Blake, still reeling from the death of his brother, Andre's donor, keeps him at arm's length despite their obvious attraction to each other. Torn between two boys, one in the past and one in the present, Andre has to figure out where he belongs and more importantly, who he wants to be before the consequences of jumping in time catch up to him and change his future for good. Fat Chance, Charlie Vega. Charlie Vega is a lot of things, smart, funny, artistic, ambitious, and fat. People sometimes have a problem with that last one, especially her mom. Charlie wants a good relationship with her body, but it's hard, and her mom leaving a billion weight loss shakes on her dresser doesn't help. The world and everyone in it has ideas about what she should look like. Thinner, lighter, slimmer faced, straighter haired. Be smaller, be wider, be quieter. But there's one person who's always been in Charlie's corner, her best friend, Amelia. Slim, popular, athletic, totally dope. So when Charlie starts a tentative relationship with a cute classmate, Brian, the first worthwhile guy to notice her, Everything is perfect until she learns one thing. He asked Amelia out first. So is she his second choice or what? Does he even really see her? Ugh, everything is now officially a mess. Prepped. Always be ready for the worst day of your life. This is the mantra that Becca has grown up with. 
Her family is part of a community community of doomsday preppers, a neighborhood that prioritizes survivalist training over class trips or senior proms. They're even arranging Becca's marriage with Roy, the only eligible boy in their community. Roy is a nice boy, but he's so enthusiastic about prepping that Becca doesn't really have the heart to tell him that she's actually planning to leave as soon as she can earn a full ride to a college far, far away. Then a devastating accident rocks Becca's family and pushes the entire community, including Becca's usually cynical little sister, deeper into the doomsday ideology. With her getaway plans thrown into jeopardy, the only person Becca can turn to is Roy, who reveals that he's not nearly as clueless as he's been pretending to be. We are the ashes, we are the fire. M's older sister was raped by another student after a frat party. A jury eventually found the rapist guilty on all counts, a remarkable verdict that M felt more than a little responsible for, since she was her sister's strongest advocate on social media during the trial. Her passion and outspokenness helped dissuade the DA from settling for a plea deal. M's family would have real justice. But the victory is short-lived. In a matter of minutes, justice vanishes as the judge turns the family's world upside down again by sentencing the rapist to no prison time. While her family is stunned, M is literally sick with rage and guilt. To make matters worse, a news clip of her saying that sentence makes her want to learn how to how to use this. <laughs> to make matters worse, a news clip of her saying that sentence and wanting to learn how to use a sword goes viral. From this low point, M must find a new reason to go on and help her family heal. And she finds it in the unlikely form of the story of a 15th century French noblewoman who is legendary as an avenging knight for rape victims. Like home. Nilo is all about her neighborhood, Ginger East. She loves its chill vibe, ride or die sense of community, and the memories she has growing up there with her friends. Ginger East isn't all it used to be though. After a deadly incident at the local arcade, most of her, fam most of her friends' families have moved away. Kate, whose family owns the local corner store, is still there. And as long as that stays constant, Nilo's good. When Kate's parents' store is vandalized and the vandal is still at large, Nilo is shaken to her core. And then the police and the media get involved and more of the outside world descends upon Ginger East with promises to fix the neighborhood. Suddenly, Nilo finds herself in the middle of a drama unfolding on a national scale. A shot at normal. Juniper's parents are hippies. The Jade family lives an all organic homeschool lifestyle that means no plastics, no cell phones, and no vaccines. It isn't exactly normal, but it's the only thing Juniper has ever known. She doesn't agree with her parents on everything, but she knows that to be in this family, you've got to stick to the rules. That is until the unthinkable happens. Juniper, Juniper contracts the measles and unknowingly passes the disease along with tragic consequences. She is shell-shocked and knows that she is responsible and feels simultaneously helpless and furious at her parents and herself. Now with the help of Nico, the boy who works at the library and loves movies and may just be more than a friend, Juniper comes to the, a decision. She's going to get vaccinated. Her parents refuse, so Juniper arms herself with a lawyer and prepares for battle. But is waging war for her own autonomy worth losing her family? How much is Juniper willing to risk for a shot at normal? Romance fiction. Love in English. 16-year-old Anna is a poet and lover of language, except that since she moved to New Jersey from Argentina, she can barely find the words to express how she feels. At first, she just wants to return home. Then she meets Harrison, the very cute, very American boy in her math class, and discovers the universal language of racing hearts. But when she begins spending more times with Neo, a Greek boy from her ESL class, she wonders how figuring out what her heart wants can be even more confusing than the grammar they're both trying to master. After all, the rules of English may be confounding, but there are no rules when it comes to love. A faux love story. If Beau had to describe himself, he'd say that he was a rock, steady and strong, but not particularly interesting. His grades are average, his social status unremarkable. He works at his parents' faux restaurant, and even there, he is his parents' fifth favorite employee. Not ideal. If Lynn had to describe herself, she would say that she's a firecracker. Stable when unlit, but full of potential for joy and fire. She loves art and dreams of pursuing a career in it. The only problem? 
Her parents rely on her in ways that they're not willing to admit, including working practically full-time at her own family's faux restaurant. For years, their families have been at odds, having owned competing neighborhood restaurants. But Bo and Lynn, who have avoided each other for most of their lives, both suspect that the feud stems from feelings much deeper than friendly competition. Then a chance encounter brings them into the same vicinity despite their best efforts and sparks fly, leading them both to wonder what took so long for them to connect. Amelia Unabridged. 18 year old Amelia is obsessed with the famous Orman Chronicles written by the young and reclusive prodigy N.E. Ensley. They're the books that brought her and her best friend Jenna together after Amelia's father left and her family imploded. So when Amelia and Jenna get the opportunity to attend a book festival with Ensley in attendance, Amelia is ecstatic. In a heartbeat, everything goes horribly wrong though. When Jenna gets a chance to meet the author and Amelia doesn't, the two have a blowout fight like they've never experienced. And before Amelia has a chance to mend things, Jenna is killed in a freak car accident. Grief stricken and without her best friend to guide, guide her, Amelia questions everything she had planned for the future. When a mysterious rare edition of the Orman Chronicles arrives for her, Amelia is convinced that it somehow has come from Jenna. Tracing the book to an obscure but enchanting bookstore in Michigan, Amelia is shocked to find herself face to face with N.E. Ensley himself. The reason for Amelia and Jenna's fight and perhaps the clue as to what Jenna wanted to tell her all along. As far as you'll take me. Marty arrives in London with nothing but his oboe and some savings from a summer job, but he's excited to start a new life where he's no longer the closeted shy kid who slips under the radar and is free to explore his sexuality without his parents' disapproval. From the outside, Marty's life looks like a perfect fantasy. In the span of a few weeks, he's made new friends, he's getting closer with his first ever boyfriend, and he's even traveling around Europe. But Marty knows that he can't keep up the facade much longer. He hasn't spoken to his parents since he arrived. He's tearing through his meager savings. His homesickness and anxiety are getting worse and worse, and he hasn't even come close to landing the job of his dreams. Will Marty be able to find a place that really feels like home? Love is a revolution. When Nala reluctantly agrees to attend an open mic night for her cousin, sister, friend Amani's birthday, she finds herself falling in instant love with Ty, the MC. He's perfect, except Ty is an activist and is spending the summer putting on events for the community when Nala would much rather be watching movies and trying out new seasonal flavors at the local creamery. In order to impress Ty, Nala ta tells a few tiny little lies to have enough in common with him. As they spend more time together, sharing more of themselves, some of those lies get harder to keep up. And as Nala falls deeper into keeping up with her lies and into love, she'll find that love is always hard and self-love is revolutionary. <coughs> A taste for love. To her friends, high school senior Liza is nearly perfect. Smart, kind, and pretty. She dreams big and never shies away from her challenge. But to her mom, Liza is anything but. Compared to her older sister, Jeannie, Liza is stubborn, rebellious, and worst of all, determined to push back against all of Mrs. Yang's traditional values, especially when it comes to dating. The one thing mother and daughter do agree on is their love of baking. Mrs. Yang is the owner of Houston's popular Yang and Yang Bakery. With college just around the corner, Liza agrees to help out at the bakery's annual junior competition to prove to her mom that she's more than just a rebellious tendency once and for all. But when Eliza arrives on the first day of the Bake Off, she realizes there's a catch. All of the contestants are young Asian American men her mother has handpicked for Eliza to date. Science fiction. The Electric Kingdom. When a deadly fly flu sweeps the globe, it leaves a shell of the world that once was. Among the survivors are Nico and her dog on a voyage devised by Nico's father to find a miss mythical portal, a young artist named Kit raised in an old abandoned cinema, and the Ignad 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 <laughs> and the Deliverer, who lives life after life in an attempt to put the world back together. As swarms of infected flies roam the earth, these few survivors must navigate the woods of a post-apocalyptic New England, meeting others along the way, each on their own quest to find lo love and life in a world that has gone dark. 
Into the Dark, a Star Wars High Republic novel. Padawan Reese Silas is being sent from the cosmopolitan galactic capital to the undeveloped frontier, and he couldn't be less happy about it. He'd rather stay at the Jedi Temple studying the archives, but when the ship he's traveling on is knocked out of hyperspace in a galactic-wide disaster, Reese finds himself at the center of the action. The Jedi and their traveling companions find refuge on what appears to be an abandoned space station, but then strange things start happening, leading the Jedi to investigate the truth behind the mysterious station, a truth that could end in a horrible tragedy. Speculative fiction, which includes fantasy and adventure. City of the Uncommon Thief. In a walled city of mile-high iron guild towers, many things are common knowledge. No book in any of the city's libraries reveals its place on a calendar or a map. No living beasts can be found within the city's walls, and no good comes to the gilder or foundling who trespasses too far from their labors. Even on the tower rooftops, where Errol and the rest of the city's teenagers pass a few short years under an open sky, no one truly believes anything uncommon is passable within the city's walls. But one guild master has broken tradition to protect her child, and as a result, the whole city faces an uncommon threat, a player of pair of black iron spikes that have the power of both sword and needle on the rib cages of men have gone missing and the mayhem they may cause rises everywhere. If the spikes are not found and contained, no wall will be high enough to protect the city or the world beyond it. And Errol, he's not dead and he's certainly not safe. Muse, which is the first book in a new series. The year is 1893 and war is brewing in the first American kingdom. But Claire has a bigger problem. Her father is a sought after inventor, but he believes his genius is a gift granted to him by his daughter's touch. So he keeps Claire under his complete control. As their providence prepares for war, Claire plans to escape even as her best friend Beatrix tries to convince her to stay and help the glowing resistance movement that wants to see a woman on the throne. But when her father's weapon fails to file a fire on the World's Fair's opening day, Claire is taken captive by Governor Remy St. Cloud's young, untried ruler. Remy believes that Claire's touch bestows graces that he's never had, and with political rivals planning his demise, Claire may be his only ally. Wings of Ebony which is the first also in a new series. Make a way out of no way is just the way of life for Rue. But when her mother is shot dead on her doorstep, life for her and her younger sister changes forever. Rue's taken from her neighborhood by the father she never knew, forced to leave her little sister behind and whisked away to Gaizon, a hidden island of magic wielders. Rue is the only half God, half human there where leaders protect their magical powers at all costs and thrive on human suffering. Miserable and desperate to see her sister on the anniversary of their mother's death, Rue breaks the island's sacred do not leave law and returns to Houston only to discover that black kids are being forced into crime and violence. And her sister Tasha is in danger of falling away to the very forces that claimed their mother's life. City of Villains, also the first book in a new series is basically Disney villains meets Gotham in a fairy tale inspired crime series. Mary Elizabeth Hart is a high school senior by day, but at night she's an intern at Monarch City Police Department. She watches with envy from behind the desk as detectives come and go, trying to contain the city's growing crime rate. For years, tension has simmered between the city's elite wealthy people and their plans to gentrify the decaying neighborhood called The Scar, once upon a time the epicenter of all things magic. When the daughter of one of the city's most powerful businessmen goes missing, Mary Elizabeth is thrilled when the chief actually puts her on the case. But what begins as one missing person report soon multiplies, leading her down a rabbit hole of a city in turmoil. There she finds a girl with horns, a boyfriend with secrets, and what happens to be a sea monster lurking in a poison lake. As the mystery circles closer to home, Mary finds herself caught in the fight between those who once had magic and those who will do anything to bring it back. This series explores the reimagined origins of Maleficent, Ursula, Captain Hook, and other infamous Disney villains like you've never seen before. 
the wide starlight. According to Arctic lore, if you whistle at the northern lights, they'll swoop down and carry you off forever. 16-year-old Eline knows it's true because it happened to her mother. She was there the night on the remote glacier when her mother whistled and vanished. Years later, she's living with her dad on Cape Cod when she discovers the northern lights may be visible for one night on the Cape and hatches a plan to use the lights to contact her missing mother. And it works. Her mother arrives with a hazy story of where she's been all this time. Eli knows that no one will believe them, so she keeps it all a secret. But when magical dangerous things start happening, such as narwhals appearing in Cape Cod Bay, meteorites landing in the yard, three shadowy fairy tale princesses whispering ominous messages, all these secrets start to become more like lies. It's all too much too fast, and Eli pushes her mother away, not expecting her to disappear as abruptly as she reappeared. Her mother's gone again and Eli's devastated until she finds the note written in her mother's elegant scrawl. Find me where I left you. And so off to the glacier, Eli goes. Game changer. All it took was one hit on the football field and suddenly Ash's life doesn't look quite the way he remembered it. Impossible though it seems, he has been hit into another dimension and keeps on bouncing through the worlds that are almost, but not quite his own. The changes start small, but they soon quickly spiral out of control as Ash slides into universes where he has everything he's ever wanted, universes where society is stuck in the past, universes where he finds himself looking at life through entirely different eyes. And if he isn't careful, the world he's learning to see more clearly could blink out of existence. What big teeth. Eleanor has been estranged from her wild family for years. When she flees boarding school after a horrifying incident, she goes to the only place she thinks is safe, the home she left behind. But when she gets there, she struggles to fit in with her monstrous relatives who prowl the woods around the family estate and read fortunes in the guts of birds. Eleanor finds herself desperately trying to hold the family together in order to save them all. She must learn to embrace her family of monsters and tame the darkness inside her. This golden flame. Orphaned and forced to serve her country's ruling group of scribes, Karis wants nothing more than to find her brother, long ago shipped away. But family bonds don't matter to the scriptorium, whose sole focus is unlocking the magic of an ancient automaton army. In her search for her brother, Karis does the seemingly impossible. She awakens a hidden automaton. Intelligent with a conscience of his own, Alex has no idea why he was made or why his father, the nation's greatest traitor, once tried to destroy all the automatons. Suddenly, the scriptorium isn't just trying to control Karis, it's hunting her. Together with Alex, Karis must find her brother and the secret that's held her country in its power for centuries. And lastly, we have The Sword of Surtur, which is the second book in the Marvel Legends of Asgard series. Tyr, the god of war and elder brother of Thor, embarks on a quest to regain his honor and place at Odin's side. Spurred on by loyal young Bjorn Wolfsbane and bewitching Lorelei, the trio set out to steal a sliver of twilight, the sword of a fire giant Surtur, who will one day bring about Ragnarok and destroy Asgard. But the fiery realm of Muspelheim is fraught with volcanic trolls, lava kraken, and Surtur's brood of mysterious murderous warriors. Tyr must overcome his own feelings of inadequacy and the motives of his allies or risk triggering the apocalypse and cursing his name forever. So those are all of our awesome new teen books that we got in February. So thanks for listening. As always, if any of these books sound interesting, and you'd like to place them on hold for pickup, feel free to email me your library card number and the title, and I'll get them on hold for you. And as always, again, if you are a teen watching and you need volunteer hours and you love reading, feel free to email me to learn how you can earn hours by reviewing teen books. And until next time, thanks for watching this installment of Get Yeti to Read. And I hope you found some interesting titles you're looking forward to. I'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching. Bye.